all for being with us for today's uh, pre-meeting. And um, so uh, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just go ahead and turn it over to you to uh, get us started. Thank you. So first, we just want to run through the agenda for tonight. So if you have any questions on the agenda, we do have several items on the consent agenda. And here's one I want to point out on consent agenda is the audit contract for next year, the 2019 audit contract. The audit committee did review this and approve it. I had one question on that item. Is Did we um, put it out to RFP again, or was it just a... It was a continuation of the existing contract. We didn't have okay. time between the last audit close and out in time to do an RFP. Okay. And then you have the three-year contract. This is the second year for three years. Okay. Thank you. So it, we would need the commission to sign that tonight after it's been approved. Okay. And then in presentations, we have Stoney, I did see Stoney here. Um, there's a breastfeeding proclamation, and I'm not sure if you already had a commission that wanted to read that proclamation. Uh, we have not discussed it yet, so I think there was some interest in from uh, Commissioner Edwards, but she won't be here this evening, so we haven't talked about it yet. So if anyone's interested, uh, just let me know. We'll figure it out between now and then. I'd be happy to do it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sounds like you got it. Thanks, Jessica. Very relevant in my house right now. <laughs> yes. Um, I think Jerry's asking to make sure we all of our mics are on. Are they all on? I think they are. Yes. That um that one is it the wireless one. I think you may need to turn it on if y'all need to speak. Okay. Um, they just don't turn it on because it has a time. I think a certain amount of time that it'll stay charged. Yeah. <laughs> and and maybe good. maybe slide that one a little bit closer to you and Jasmine. Great. They're very, they're very right. sensitive, so they put right. them away from you oh, guys yeah, on too. purpose. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then um, Rescue Ministries will be here tonight to talk about a recent award that they just received by Abba's House. The county does partner with Abba's House, so you will hear about that tonight. And then on new business, Commissioner Newman is attending the NCACC, the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners Conference. So we do need to delegate a voting delegate for tonight for that conference, which is going to be in Winston Salem in Guilford County, uh, and, uh, August twenty second. Greensboro, right? That's right. Greensboro. Guilford County. Yes. Greensboro. Is um, are any other commissioners interested in attending? So, so this is the annual meeting of the County Commissioners Association. That was. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've been, I've been, I've been several several years, and I think you know, it's, we should be there every year. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not. I mean, you're, you're participating more than you are. Um, it's not like you're driving, like, you know, what we're doing. You're just uh, basically getting educated and hearing what everybody else is doing. It's a great, great time to network. Yeah. So. Yes. Okay. So if anybody else is interested, you don't have to decide today, but um, let us know pretty soon so you can get registered for it. But I'm planning on going, so yes. we'll have someone there. Right, so it'd be a resolution that we would sign to make you the vote and delegate. Okay. We have that. Right. All right. Great. And then there's a donation for new mothers, also some breast pumps that was donated to the Health and Human Services. We'd like to accept that donation that we can help our community. Yes. Um, and the last item would be House Bill 370. I think several commissioners and you will be that discussion tonight. Okay. And that's just a discussion item. There's no action no discussion action on that. Correct. All right. Thank you. So then we'll get into staff updates and leave it off is Jennifer Pike from our tax collections office. Now that we are through with fiscal 19, this would be a good opportunity to run through a few things that you'll be seeing uh, in the next month or so. And give, give us an opportunity to open some dialogue if you have any questions for me. So the topics that, that I'd like to cover today are the annual settlement, uh, the order of collection, and the collection action. So the annual settlement, there are three key components. Um, 
and this requires approval. The annual settlement isn't required by statute after the end of a fiscal year. It's the summary of net levy and collections for Buncombe County and all entities we collect, bill and collect on behalf of. Also included in that is a report from the North Carolina Department of Motor Vehicles for the revenues they bill and collect for registered motor vehicle property taxes. The second component of that is a list of unpaid prior year property taxes. So this would be for tax year 2018, they're left outstanding as of June 30, 2009. The third component is a list of taxpayers who've been found to be insolvent, and this is uncollectible, and this only applies to personal property. So for example, if a business closes and we cannot locate the owner or find the property, we, we deem it to be insolvent. And this only applies to tax year 2013 and prior. So this is not recent years. So the annual settlement would, will be on the August 6th agenda. So a few key points uh, for the annual settlement tax year 2018. We achieved, achieved a collection rate of 99.89%. Um, the net levy was $185,929,736. That left an uncollected amount, $201,913. I'd also like to point out that of that levy, uh, on the, or we're approaching a million dollars at half a percent of that levy at $929,600. So these are, this is an illustration of where Buncombe fell with the collection rate for the two years prior to the most recent fiscal year. So fiscal years 2018 and 2017, among the 11 largest North Carolina counties, this is, is where we fell, and I, I'm very proud of my staff for, for the hard work they do to get us second in line amongst the, the 11 largest counties. I'd also like to point out that the average of the 11 largest counties is 99.39%. So that's about a half a percent lower than, than we achieved. I have a question. So does that mean that of all of the property taxes that we are forecasted, you know, that we believe are, 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 are due to be paid, we collect 99.88% of those funds? So these are regular property taxes. So this is not registered motor vehicle. It is real property mm -hmm. and personal property. Mm -hmm. And this is an actual, this is by June 30. This is what we collected of the net levy. Does that answer yeah, and the so and so so of all the of all the taxes that we believe are owed in those categories, we collect ninety nine point eight eight percent of those. Yes, in, and nine nine eight eight was was twenty eighteen's rate. Okay, that is so impressive. On the vehicle side, though, that basically comes through whenever they like, pre tax vehicles. It does, so, yes. So that's, so that's almost one hundred percent guaranteed. It is. It is ninety nine point five average because they do have some, some plates that are limited registration plates that they can't collect on. Any other questions on that one? The next topic is um, order of collection. So immediately following the approval of the annual settlement, we move to an adoption of the order of collection. This is what gives me the authority and actually commands me to collect property taxes for the coming year. And it's it's very specific. It, this. This is verbatim on our order of collection, and it is what is listed in statute that should be included. I also have an oath with my bond and my appointment that I'm to follow, I follow the law, I swear to follow the law, and I carry out my responsibilities impartially and without influence. This order of collection, I also like to point out, covers Buncombe County and all the municipalities and districts we collect on behalf. The only, the only thing in the tax bill, and I know it's your part to collect the money, and I sit here and I look back and I've heard things that people have, you know, especially the ones that are on totally fixed income, the six, seven hundred dollars a month fixed income, people that had to rock me forever and are trying to make payments. If they're trying, we need to try to figure out how to help them better without turning it over to an attorney. It costs four times as much to be able to keep the property. That's the only thing that I see in anything. You know, we're at 99.8%, and that's a great job, okay? So 
but there has to be a little help somewhere mm -hmm. for this this small group of people. I, if they got forty thousand or a hundred thousand dollars worth of land and they have no money, it's a different story. But if they just have a, a mobile home or whatever and they're struggling, as Keith told me in that meeting that day, or in the meeting, he just told me their gentleman said if the taxes go up, he's going to have you know he eats peanut butter and jelly for supper. He's going to put the jelly and. We got to prove to the people because once it turns out one, one of the attorneys here in town, it's it costs a fortune, and that's just got to be careful. We do. Eyes. And, and well, we I've do. seen it where it wasn't careful. Okay. I understand. We do encourage um, payment arrangements, and we we we. Yeah, but if they can't make, we got to figure out a way to help them to get through to another point. Yes. Especially this one little group down here, and that's about fifteen hundred. So that's where I'm looking at. If I know those, then I can try to work out a payment arrangement with them that fits. But what? But my concern is I don't want them to to perpetuate the problem of you know it, the taxes grow with each passing year well, on their outstanding amount. So I wouldn't want them to be upside down in, in taxes. And you have a problem I have with it is that we have a group of lawyers out here who are just they're no more than avalanche cases. And, you know, when I see people that they're delinquent on a $400 lot, and they end up, when one a lawyer gets a hold of it, they have to pay almost $3,000 to get that lot clear. I got a problem with that. And then the lawyer they're working with, that all he has is a cell phone and a post office box, not even an office. You know, to me, we're taking advantage of poor people here. And I agree, we, it's great to have the 99% you know, deal, mm -hmm. but morally, I have a problem with that. You know, if we're taking advantage, you know, it's some people struggle. You know, everybody's not fortunate, they have to struggle. But I think we could do a better job of helping these people out because it's such a, it's a small amount. But when I see, you know, the leeches out there, we're taking advantage of them. And this is something we need to look out for. I mean, you know, I have a moral problem with that. Uh, it's just not fair. And I understand your concern. And, and please know that's not our first option. We, we exhaust every collection action remedy we have available to us before we take that step. If, if a taxpayer is, is still in communication with us and they're, we're working with them, then we don't take that step. And then, so if, if an attorney is, um, if an account is referred to an external attorney, they still have a period of time to respond to that attorney or work or contact us and begin working with us. And that, that attorney is, is out of the picture then. So that one, is. I thought once the attorney's in the picture, it's the attorney's deal. It, the once the attorney seen. has invested time and has approved fees, then the attorney takes ownership. But if the taxpayer contacts us once they receive that attorney letter, then we do make an effort to, to work with them. When do we turn this over to an attorney? If, once we have exhausted our, the collection actions that we can take. So for, for What's example, the time frame? It depends. So can I jump in real quick? Because I think what Jennifer is also saying to the future commissioner, we've looked at that issue as well. Uh, the time frame depends, but it only goes to an attorney once that citizen has stopped talking to us completely. So we first, we do set up a payment plan. And if they're making payments, and we make a payment plan that they can afford. So it's not, if you have 400 on a bill, then we can have it where you can't afford to pay. So I've actually talked with Jennifer about this specific issue because you guys have raised it before. Right. And we have worked with Jennifer to make sure that we contact the citizen, we work with the citizen. If the citizen does not respond to us, and I think that is over a period of two or three months before they stop talking to us. If we don't hear from them at all, then it goes to the attorney. When the attorney sends a letter, many times we'll get a response from the attorney because that letter is official. <coughs> They'll get a response. If they do contact us in that time period, the attorney can give them seven, and we're going to increase that to 14 days. So they get 14 days from the time they get a letter from the attorney to respond. If that happens, there's no fees on the attorney's part. The cost doesn't go up. But they need to talk to us is when they stop talking to us and when they ignore letters and calls from our staff 
is when it goes to the attorney's office. So I would agree with you about the moral obligation to not run people out of their hooks and not try to foreclose. So that is our very last resort. Our goal, more than anything else, is to talk to our citizens. So the word, we're telling you this now, you can put that word out, but this would also come to the Board of Economic Office of Six. And we would stress, please call our office. Do not hide, do not duck. We're not trying to do anything to you other than to collect debt. And that collection can stay within our office without incurring any fees if you would just talk to us. And well, at least try to make contact. Okay. Yes, sir. I do know a person that did contact and try their way in the world. He had already paid half his payments. That's where he was at. Did he probably do everything right? Probably not. But he's just a citizen of the county and he had half of it paid. Then Buncombe County would not accept any more from him. It all had to go through the attorney. And that's just like Al said there a minute ago. Then it skyrockets. So now he has to work three times as hard to be able to just pay his property tax to stay in his property than he did before. And that's when you're a landscaper, you don't do much in the wintertime, okay? And that's just the way it was. And uh, we've got to figure out how to fix this mess. If you, you, weren't, you weren't around here during these problems, I understand that, okay? Right. Neither one of you ladies. So I have, have, have problems. So I've got, I've got, a, got a question. Um, why do we have to take it to, uh, you know, and I understand some people are going out to hide and not communicate, mm -hmm. but um, why, do, why do we have to take it to an outside attorney? Could we not use uh, attorneys that are, um, that are inside? Well, one thing in, in, in my experience with the county, when I started with the county in 2001, uh, I was attached to the tax office. And I did some of these foreclosures for the for the county at that time. Many times, if you're in house, and when I was an in-house lawyer, you send out a demand letter. Yeah. I do a title search, find right. out where these people are. It comes on county letterhead, and it still gets ignored. So sometimes, many times, you refer it out, and once they get a, a letter from a lawyer with real letterhead, they'll start communicating and pay. So sometimes it it's very helpful. But you do we have to charge that much? You know, we need to figure out how to take that letterhead from another attorney, whether it's her, or you, or any other attorney, and have a letter sent. And if they respond to it, yeah, let's pay a little bit to that attorney for what he's done. But he don't deserve three to $4,000, $400 bill. Oh, I, I understand. I understand that. I mean, that, that's, that's the difficulty is between the compassion piece and the collector's oath. It is. It's, so, right. um, and I understand you haven't collected it. So, is is there a way to uh, just contract a demand letter instead of turning it over to an attorney for collection? We could just to contract with an attorney to do it to do it to do a demand letter to get to get you're, someone's attention. In a sense, I would be reluctant to do that because then you're asking the lawyer their position in letterhead to conceivably give an empty threat. I mean, I would, as a lawyer, would never want to send a demand unless I was fully prepared to follow up on it. Okay. How many, so, how many, um, how many uh, times does this happen a year that gets to that point? So for this fiscal year we just completed, there were 437 accounts that went through an attorney referral. Mm -hmm. So and that's consistent with the prior two years. We uh, was 427. So how do we measure that? How do we measure the success of that? I mean, we can talk through this all day long, but somewhere we got to have we got to have a measurement of it. And uh, so, how do we measure the success of that? I think we need to measure metrics on how many of those that are referred are actually paid, or how many of them make it to the next step. Sure. Um, which is the actual foreclosure process. And compared to what we refer, the number of properties that actually make it all the way through a confirmed sale of a foreclosure process are, are very low in percentage. So for example, in the last 18 months, so January 2018 through June 2019, the, for, the actual confirmed sales foreclosures 
there were five properties that were land only, four properties that were the owner was in another state, two properties were condemned or uninhabitable, and one property was abandoned. So those were the only confirmed sale foreclosures uh, for the, the previous 18 months. So when you run the numbers on those, if 430 or so are getting referred, that's 0.3% of all property tax bills. If a dozen are actually leading to foreclosure or condemnation, that's less, less than 0%. So I think when we think of it sort of on a systems level, certainly we want to be thinking about the individuals on the other side of those letters. I think when we think about it on a systems level, it seems like this, it's working in many of the ways we're intending it to. But why couldn't we do a, what is it, an RFP? Since we're talking about such small numbers, why couldn't we let the law firms bid on that and take the lowest bidder, the ones that would give us the best deal, rather than to have all these sharks out there now? We, Wouldn't it make more sense and be a lot more efficient? We recently did an RFQ for RFQ, okay. attorney services, mm -hmm. and we had five respondents. Um, we currently, we've been using three, so we had five respondents and we'll be entering those two additional ones in the rotation. So we have done exactly what you suggested, is to put out that service for bid, and we got qualifications, the RFQ's qualifications, to make sure they can carry and do the work that we're asking them to do. In the past, we were using three, so they're not all sharks out there, it seems that way, but we actually had a contract with three in the past, and we would rotate. So of the 12, we would do three, and you get the first one, and then you'll get continue going through our rotation. We now have five that has responded in town that can do that work. So you would spread those 12 amounts five. The good news would be, if there's good news here, is that because there's only, there's five, there's no one person that can go after somebody as a shark. You can share that with that amount. But again, our first goal would be meet with the taxpayers, talk with taxpayers, as Jasmine said, it's a very small percentage. When you look at the number of bills that we are sending, and then the eight bills, 1.1 thousand or so bills that actually went to our collection status, if you would give us the name of the ones, if you hear of anybody out there that has this opportunity to work with us, please let us know. So that's what our goal, not to put anybody out there house, but how can we work with them I did do to that. get that? And this was like last year. I, I did come over with them, so. It, uh, it didn't help. Right. It was already in attorney's hands, and it's just, I am, you know. So the message we need to get out early is before it gets to that point, come talk. Well, so we'll, we'll I, work on that. And, and then there's an understanding. We're sitting and we're getting an understanding. Right. But there's 258,000 people out there that probably a tenth of them do have an understanding. Mm -hmm. Just like Jasmine said, the number <clears> broke down to hardly zero in your areas. But we we try, we need to try to help the people, especially the people that worked all their life, lived here. The property tax now. There was a gentleman in West Asheville a while, a few years back. Told me, he says, well, he says, uh, it took me 30 years to pay for my house. 30 years. He says, now I pay for it again every five. And just the property tax more. So we we can keep going up in certain areas, but these people have tired and worked all their life. They're homeless, and Al's just like me. We're both, you know, in the seventies, and it's uh, I'm going to do what I can. That's one of my goals. People say, "What kind of goal do you have?" I, my goal is for the people here to figure out how they can stay at their home. I saw uh, a man and a lady in an old truck over at. Uh, next door one day. And she didn't look good at all. They'd been sleeping in McDonald's parking lot. They'd been evicted from property tax bill. There was a trail. Okay. And they were staying in McDonald's parking lot and using ice to cut the dreads on the man. So I give them, I give them my money, not county's money, to try to help them. And I know we have DSS, we have all these things. We got all the perfect pictures, but they don't work most of the time. I just want them to be able to have a place to play to and sleep and not have to worry. You know, 
these things were, I mean, they were dire. So I'm gonna get off my thing. So thank you. Yeah. I'll well, you. I think the, um, I mean, I think the, if people have specific suggestions on a different process, that would be, right. you know, if we can't just, you know, I mean, that's a very compelling story, but we need just to have a consistent process. It needs to be a, you know, it needs to be a reasonable process and a, and a compassionate process. But if people have specific suggestions on how to do it differently in terms of the lengths of time and things like that, I think that's, that would be our role is to kind of make some specific changes to the process if we think that uh, we need or call we need to do that. So. Well, it might, is data available about the, for the 400 or so that actually referred to attorneys, do we have data available about actually the amount that's in question? Because it would seem, I would imagine that the logic would follow if someone's struggling that much that they might have a lower property value and the tax amount might actually be a smaller dollar amount. So that might be an interesting, to really drill down among the 1,300 and then the 400. So, yeah. Of who's sit, if it's two hundred dollars that's sitting between them keeping their house and leaving their house, that's a very interesting policy question for us to think about. Yeah, and I mean you could have, you could very easily just spread that out. It could yes. include right. the attorney costs, it could include costs today, it could include those yep. things. You know, and you have to you have to balance uh, you know compassion and process. You know, because I don't like my bill, I have to pay it. You know, but. If I ever had a situation where I got in trouble, I would sure want people to, mm -hmm. to work with me. So it's been a great conversation. Yeah. I appreciate Mike yes. and bringing it up. Yeah, me too. Um, one other question. Uh, if people do um, have a payment plan or fall behind on it, do we charge interest on that or is it just? State law is interest. Interest will continue to accrue until the, the bill is paid. Okay. And what's the interest rate? So the first month is 2%. Uh, every month thereafter is three quarters of a percent. Mm -hmm. so, over, so over an annual rate would be? Uh, is it 9%? Not 9%, okay. 9%, yeah. and that's, but that's a state policy. That is so state policy, yes. All right. All right, well, thank you for the update. And it did prompt a good discussion. I think so. Um, so one more. If I may just sure. make a couple more notes. So we, we've talked about the number of tax bills, and I wanted to touch on the, the <clears throat> new, unique um, bills with collection actions. We oh. do explore the information we have available. We do use some services that help us find information, contact information, banking information, to try to avoid getting to the last step. We try very hard to, to avoid that. Sometimes we simply can't. Um, and the payment arrangements are, are pretty popular, um, over 3,200 of those. And I, I equate those similarly to a, to a mortgage where you make a monthly mortgage payment. And part of your many mortgage payments include uh, property tax and insurance. So we're, we do try to extend that option. And it, it seems to grow with every passing year. We continually try to educate. One other note, there is going to be um, some new monthly reporting coming your way, and I'll be back in front of you in August as, so we can walk through that to see what's going to be coming in the future. Are there any other questions I can answer for you? I'd be happy to. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. 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 Thank
Um, and the project includes 98 homes. Uh, there'll be 32 single family homes and 66 townhome units in the, the total uh, project. Um, the, there's a portion of it that we're focusing on um, both today and then when this item for you again at your uh, first meeting in August um, is the phase one section. So this is a 38 unit portion of the, the larger development it includes both single family and town units. Um, the construction is actually already underway on site. So they are um, working on site already. And that construction is scheduled to be completed in the spring of 2023. This is a pretty quickly moving project. Um, with Habitat for Humanity, we find that the units, they're able to actually uh, produce about 15 a year within a project, um, largely the result of volunteer uh, hours that go into the project. Uh, so the total project cost for phase one, which is again that first portion of the project, is $6.8 million. <clears throat> Through the FY 2019 Affordable Housing Services Program uh, project and Habitat for Humanity received $240,000 in funding to support that um, portion of Phase 1. Uh, they came back uh, earlier this year and requested additional funding uh, to support all 38 units uh, and the entire Phase 1 project. That request, uh, after meeting with them over several months, ended up being $680,800. Um, and this breaks down kind of how the, the currently approved award um, versus the additional award requests uh, are laid out. Um, and so in the initial award request, it was to support the 24 of the 38 units in phase one. Um, this is a combination of a construction loan with some down payment assistance. Uh, and, and the purposes of down payment assistance are to, to reduce the burden to the home buyer and their ability to get into a mortgage. Uh, so it's used to offset the cost to the buyer. Um, and so they received the award of 240000 They had requested funds beyond that to support all 38 units initially, uh, but the Affordable Housing Services Program is a limited pool of funds, uh, and after signing other allocations, uh, that was the amount that we had available to support the project at the time. Um, they came back and requested additional funding support uh, to support all 38 units. Uh, and after conversations with the, the Affordable Housing uh, Committee, um, they determined that probably the best course of action to provide that support would be through additional down payment assistance and not a combined construction and down payment loan. Um, and what they were attempting to do in those discussions between Habitat and the committee was to keep the project from the parameters of the Affordable Housing Services Program. And that program allows up to $20,000 per unit as support and down payment assistance. And so through the addition of these funds, it would provide up to that maximum so that they're able to reach 80% AMI and possibly lower additional down payment assistance. Uh, so the Affordable Housing Committee did make a formal recommendation, which will be coming to you uh, officially at first meeting in August. And that would be to provide funding support in the amount of $680,000. Um, this would be a down payment assistance loan and it would maintain the $20,000 per unit cap, which is established under the existing program. At your August 6th meeting, we will have Asheville Area Habitat for Humanity present so that they can present more detailed information on the project, um, including plans so that you can see the layout of the project and that sort of thing, and also give you uh, information about their need and why we sought the additional funding. Um, we would also come forward at that time um, with a community development loan agreement um, we've been in process between county uh, legal staff and with Habitat to develop contract language, which would be agreeable to both sides. Um, so we'd be bringing the information about the request, the recommendation of the committee, and also a draft uh, loan agreement that the board does approve that allocation of funds. Any questions? All right, thanks, Matt. And we'll jump into the next item, um, which is related to uh, home award. Um, and so, again, we touched on this when we were at the home meeting in early June, um, but the home funding is federal HUD funding that comes through the Asheville Regional Housing Consortium. I just wanted to touch on the fact that that is a four county consortium. Um, the lead entity is the city of Asheville, so they actually receive the funds um, and they administer those funds. They receive approximately $1.3 million a year and have for the last several years with some variation. 
uh, $1.3 million a year in home funds. Um, and there is some variation in that. It's a, an average. Um, they received a little less than that in the last year. And they have representation from all participating jurisdictions. Uh, currently, we have two county staff that sit on the consortium uh, and vote on projects as they come through. So the home program, uh, just for a little bit more detail, as I mentioned, it's a HUD program. Uh, these are grant funds um, on a reimbursable basis. They are for affordable housing efforts. Um, they can fund things, new construction, rehabilitation, down payment assistance. So they do some similar things to what we're able to do with our county affordable housing services program. Uh, they do have some other activities that they undertake that we don't um, directly. Uh, but it's an opportunity for our nonprofit agencies and for-profit agencies um, and community housing development organizations to access more federal dollars. So in uh, the current home award, which this process took place over the last several months, it was in the spring, they began taking applications in January, and decisions about allocations through the consortium were made in late April. Um, the funds available were uh, just a little over 1.1 million. Um, the funds that were requested approached nearly three million. So there's a discrepancy always between what is requested and what is awarded. Uh, but Buncombe County projects, so projects are identified by their location. Uh, Buncombe County projects that were identified, uh, one was selected receiving three hundred and twelve thousand uh, dollars in support through the home uh, award. Uh, there were seven hundred fifty-six thousand dollars in requests that came in. So that was the selected project, and that was the funding that they received. We brought all of that information about the projects that were both presented and which received the award um, to the Affordable Housing Committee. Um, and the committee made a recommendation about the existing budgeted home match. Um, so each year the county budgets funding for home match. Um, and that <coughs> annual allocation is $75,000. We also have program income and then in certain cases unused home match that so we might have awarded match and then they actually didn't draw that down because it's reimbursement based so that rolls forward in the fund um, so there was hundred and twenty three thousand two hundred and fourteen dollars available to allocate to projects um, and the affordable housing committee is recommending eighty seven thousand nine hundred and eight dollars be applied to a workforce homestead incorporated project that's the Jasper project it's a multi-family um, rental construction project it did receive home funding. They requested $400,000. They received uh, or allocated $312,000. And this is the balance to get to their initial request, uh, was the recommendation. This project is seeking tax credits. And we should know in mid to late August if that tax credit uh, application is approved or not. Um, it is a $15 million total project. Their tax credit request is over $10 million. The information about the full scope of the project and all the funding that they're leveraging together would come through to you when uh, this item come before you at your first meeting in August. The other project that they recommended, again, because they had a, a pool of $123,000 available to allocate to uh, home eligible projects, was to apply the balance of that fund, which was $35,306, to an Asheville Area Habitat Humanity Project, the Brevard Road Project. And this is a homeowner construction project. So again, it's building single family homes. They had requested $100,000 uh, to support four uh, units with down payment assistance, and this was the balance available. So they can leverage that um, as, as possible in order to support as many units as they could produce. Uh, together, this allocation would support just over 23 units. Um, the Jasper project is a 100 unit uh, project. And then the Asheville Area Habitat Humanity is a four-unit project. Again, very different projects, one being multifamily versus single-family construction. And so what we, we, we would be bringing forward to you at your first meeting in August um, is, again, the recommendation from the Affordable Housing Committee and a resolution to authorize the county manager to enter into those agreements and contracts necessary to distribute those funds to those agencies. Again, this is a reimbursement-based request that they would produce uh, information about the work and the cost before that funding would be released um, to the entities. And I'd be happy to answer any questions on this project as well. All right. Thanks, Matt. Looks like we're good.
Um, just here to give you a brief update on the sustainability office and some of the work you've been doing and some of the things that we've got coming down the pipeline over the next several months that we wanted to make you aware of. So uh, just as a, a brief introduction, obviously there are two primary uh, commissioner adopted resolutions that drive the vast majority of the work that we do in the sustainability office. We have a 2% annual carbon reduction goal for our internal county operations and we've adopted a 100% renewable goal for county operations by 2030 and for all of Buncombe County by 2042. So just some, some brief accomplishments. We're currently ahead of our 2% goal. Our 2% goal will put us at around 10% right now. And we're actually trending at about 16%. So very happy to report we're doing well on that. We're ahead of where we uh, anticipated we would be. Uh, we've leveraged about $300,000 in grant funding and the vast majority of that has gone to that next bullet point, which is weatherization of over 370 homes in Buncombe County. That's a program that we're very proud of and something that's made a real impact in a lot of people's lives. Um, we've done an additional 28 other energy projects and commercial facilities, including county facilities and some of our community uh, public agency partners. Those projects have uh, essentially offset about 920 metric tons of CO2. That's not a number resonates with people so we like to use equivalents in terms of you know what does that equal how many trees or things like that um, it's equivalent to approximately a million pounds of coal so it's a pretty significant offset with those projects in addition uh, it's about eighty-eight thousand dollars in annual energy savings for these organizations combined which and, and each project has an average payback of less than 36 months the reason I point that out is just to, to emphasize that we really do focus on not only those that have a good environmental impact, but are financially sound projects as well and pay for themselves and have a good return on investment. So obviously one of the other uh, uh, significant undertakings right now is working towards our 100% renewable goal. Um, hey, Jeremiah, I have a question for you. Absolutely. So the 20 energy projects, um, mm -hmm. those are all projects that are on um, that are not directly on county buildings, like the fire oh. stations, or, or is it a mix of like county buildings and fire stations it and other It's a mix bag, yes. Right. Okay. It's a mix most of them are community. Mm -hmm. uh, most of them are fire stations and things like that. There are a handful of county projects that we've done, chiller replacements. Actually, this building is one of them. We did an LED retrofit in this facility. Okay. So it's a mixed bag, but I would say it's probably 80% community based as opposed to internal. Right. Thanks. You have a question, sir? I, I just that, that question there. What about this building? Uh, we did an LED retrofit in this building 18 months ago, give or take. What is that? Uh, lighting. lighting. Lighting retrofit. Sorry, I apologize. <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's that's my fault for I'm assuming oh, wow. nobody lives in my world, so you know, not everybody gets those accurate. Uh, but yes, it, it's just a, it's lighting upgrades to, to reduce our, our overall energy consumption. Um, that's frankly the low hanging fruit nowadays is these LED projects because they're great payback and, and they look to reduce energy really quickly. So, um, so moving on to uh, the renewable roadmap. Uh, as you know, the county, uh, the commission approved a contract with the Cadmus Group to assist in creating a plan in terms of helping us determine how we can reach our 100% renewable goals. That was a contract with uh, a 50-50 sort of combined effort between the city and the county. Uh, the very basics of the plan are to, again, establish baseline energy data for local governments as well as for the entire community because we have a community-wide goal. You know, look at our projections for future energy demand and what that energy mix is as well, nuclear, coal, gas, etc. cetera, um, as well as to clearly design strategies for reaching our renewable goals and then model what the potential impacts of those strategies will be. And then Last and, and not least is the cost implications of those strategies. So, yeah, I just want to make, make one comment on sure. that. We're, we're very careful as we as we look at the payback of these because that original program had some replacements that the payback was just, I mean, we wouldn't want to do it. Sure. Um, Absolutely. So, you know, I think it's good to have some, some reporting on, uh, you know, to show that we're actually paying attention to the cost implications on the strategy. It's just because we pay somebody to come in and tell us that, hey, you ought to do all this, you know, it takes 40 years to get your money back. Mm -hmm. Well, <coughs> even if you don't that. know anything about it, Agreed. you know you're not going to do that. You wouldn't do it with your own money. So 
It, it is, yeah, it's a critical part of the plan to have those cost implications. Obviously, some of them are, are simple estimates because we don't know. This is a long-term plan, so we don't know what the future holds in terms of cost estimates for things like, you know, uh, solar PV. Um, but we, we do know that the trend says that they don't get more expensive over time, they're getting less expensive. So we hope that continues. Yeah, and I just think we need to really, you know, take a, we got new, new staff got new, the county manager, the new assistant county manager, mm -hmm. we need to take a really hard look at that CADMUS uh, report and, and make sure that it's not an, it's not an end all to everything. Oh, absolutely, agreed. Uh, so it, it's, it's obviously the report itself is a very ex extensive document, <laughs> uh, so we're not gonna cover everything that is in the report right now. But I did want to give you sort of a high level overview of what you can kind of expect to see outside of just the basic energy data and just telling you where we are and what our power mix looks like and things like that. We essentially broke the, the strategies down into bundles, uh, sort of a, as you can see, a pathway A, B, C, D to sort of break this out and say, here's the high level strategies that we think can help us reach these goals, things that we're currently doing and policies that we current, currently have in place for example, the landfill project is going to be a significant project for us. Uh, you know, we've got very streamlined permitting inspections, and we can model out what we think those impacts are going to be. Uh, we're looking at other highly feasible local actions that we think we can take, alternative purchasing options, uh, you know, and then, of course, those state utility level actions, because we are a very heavily regulated state in terms of our energy. We have a, a regulated monopoly in terms of our utility here. So that does present its own unique challenges. So these are just some basic examples of things like installing solar on county facilities, uh, bulk purchasing, you know, rec purchasing, you know, power purchase agreements. It, again, the plan will be much more detailed. Uh, again, I just wanted to give you a sort of high level overview of the types of things that you can probably expect to see in this document. Um, and then of course those higher level actions that would require state utility assistance. Yes. And the pathway to 100% would involve all of these pathways? Yes, okay. absolutely. Gotcha. There is no, there's no single trick right. to, to accomplishing a goal of this magnitude. Right. Um, certainly, and, and what the plan does is sort of take each individual pathway, mm -hmm. model it out for you to say, we think if we were to implement these packages of policies and strategies, we can get to 5% or 10% or et cetera. And then moving along through each of those to say, all of these bundled together, we feel like this is where it can take us. Great. Right. Is there a guarantee on that? Uh, absolutely. That is true. There is no guarantee. We do not know what the future holds. So this is a, a big step from the last time we had a board level conversation about, about this. So it's exciting. We, we can waste money with no guarantee. <laughs> Jeremiah, yes. you touched on something that mm -hmm. uh, reminded me. Where are we? the solar panel at the trash number? It's an excellent question. And uh, essentially, we're still in the due diligence period. So when we signed the contract with Duke, uh, they requested a two-year due diligence period, which we're about halfway through. Mm -hmm. uh, we do know that the project is moving forward as expected. Everything looks good up to this point. If I were to ballpark it, based on the conversations that I've had uh, with, with Duke Energy and their reps, I would say probably middle of 2020 is when we can really expect like you know boots on the ground so to speak but it's still a bit of a ballpark there they've got their engineering firm out there currently doing assessments on the facility there's the interconnection process is is what's a big hold up i'm sure brownie you've dealt with this a lot interconnecting to duke's grid you have to go through a queue and even when it's duke doing it you still have to get in the back of the line so they have to apply for connecting to their own grid and still have to get in the back of the line. Explain that one to me, but that's the way it works. Uh, and that process for utility scale size project tends to take two years. And I think that's really why they gave themselves that due diligence period. So, but it's moving on nicely. And as far as we can tell, it's, it's still about the, the anticipated size was about a five-ish megawatt project, which is very sizable. Uh, and it's still online to be about that size. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Um, this, I guess, we relate to pathway A or B, but are, <clears throat> excuse me. are we currently, as a standard practice, kind of um, assessing new capital projects that county's getting involved with? To, I'm, I'm thinking 
you're, you're thinking what I'm thinking. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> <That's what laughs> you're yeah. Okay, great. Uh, no, 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 absolutely. As yeah. a part of this entire process, I mean, what we'll be bringing to the board will be suggestions on internal policies for new construction, renovation. How do we handle that going forward, knowing we have these aggressive, aggressive renewable energy programs? And so, you know, we'll, we'll put together a package of options for the board to look at and say, you know, this is how far we want to take this in terms of what our our internal requirements are for new construction or roof replacements or things of that nature. Um, we obviously don't have the legal authority to make anyone else do anything, sure. um, but for our own internal facilities, we can make those as stringent as we want. So, right. You know. And then we also, I mean, like with the early childhood, for instance, the county's investing a half a million dollars in the construction of a new early childhood facility. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether. I have no idea whether that would be a site where solar would make sense, but it, but at least flagging questions like that as we, as we pursue Absolutely. different projects. That's, that's another part of I think that that look at what our internal policies are. If we're going to invest in construction, whether it's our facility or someone else's, do we want to make that a part of the process? You know, I, I obviously I believe that we do uh, going forward since we do have not just an internal goal but a community wide renewable energy goal. But yeah, those are absolutely policies that we'll be bringing to the board. In the coming months, to suggest uh, how we move forward. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I think when we look at new construction, we're just going to be going to be really careful that I mean, you can put solar on something that's got horrible windows in it, and then you know, or the quality of air and it's terrible because the HVAC is, you know, but you have renewable energy on it. So we're, this mm -hmm. is a very we're going to have to be very very careful with this when we're when it's. Uh, to, to yeah. new construction, new construction, and, and up you know, yeah. uh, and and upgrade for you yes. know as you used the term retrofit. I yep. mean, you retrofit solar on a building that the building's not you know got got uh, I mean the quality of the air and it's terrible and the windows are you know need to be replaced. And, I couldn't agree more. You know. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I will I will say that the sustainability office's perspective on any kind of renovation is that we focus on efficiency first. Uh, it's, the, it's, it's the biggest bang for your buck, and as you, you know, very rightly pointed out, if you put solar panels on a building that's just leaking air through the windows, you're, you're wasting everybody's Absolutely. time and money. So, I, I agree with you completely, and uh, that will be a part of the assessment process. It's, you know, as we look at what facilities make sense for us, uh, we'll, we'll be looking at, you know, are there opportunities for efficiency first? One more question. Mm -hmm. We're paying somebody to tell us what we think we need to know. But aren't we paying somebody else out in Colorado seventy thousand dollars a year to that were, was part of the energy board? Um, if I remember correctly, in twenty thirteen, I believe, and this, I believe what you're referring to is uh, a group called the Shaw Group. They came in and did uh, energy audits. For a number of county facilities, um, I don't remember the cost. It's been well. I, I thought ago. that one was for free because when I talked to do, they said that one was for free. But now we're we stepped up and now we're paying them to do it. Are we paying them to do it, Brownie? I think the Shaw Group. Well, they weren't from Colorado. They're from Charlotte, well, aren't they? And, they, and I think well, Duke. I think Duke well. rebates did cover the cost of that, if I, if I recall. I think so, what you may be thinking of, um, Mike, is. Um, we did pay the Rocky Mountain Institute, but that was a one-time gotcha. deal a couple years ago, so that's not an ongoing thing. So how much are we have in your department today? Money. How much? much? What is my budget? How much in your budget does the county have? Uh, the, the Clean Energy Fund budget is $350,000. Uh, that does not include operating expenses, which is essentially just my salary and benefits. There's not a lot in addition to that. Um, the Rocky Mountain Institute was a joint effort between the city, the county, and Duke Energy to create the Energy Innovation Task Force um, and to facilitate that process. Well, from what I understood, the energy is one that brought this task force in to start with. They asked to bring it in, didn't it because of their people in this area. So, how long does it stay? That's what I want. Sure. sure. Um, well, the next steps for us in terms of what we do with this renewable energy report. Uh, the report itself will be available for public comment. Uh, we have a draft of it that we'll be putting on our website uh, to just get some additional community feedback. We've had a number of stakeholder engagement groups and, and public input sessions up to this point, uh, but this will be sort of that last last opportunity, putting it out there for folks to have some, some opportunity for public input. 
And obviously, uh, you know, the plan comes up with a, a variety of strategies. So what we're looking at next is to develop an integrated implementation plan, obviously with input from the remainder of the staff that's, that's uh, going to be working with the general services, finance, budget, et cetera. And what we're really focusing on at this point are the, the, the immediate actions that we can take to start making a dent in this goal. And that is primarily to focus on uh, site assessments. So looking at you know where does renewable energy make the most sense? We're looking at bringing in uh, other public partners uh, to potentially look at doing this in a, a aggregated way. So looking at essentially bringing in school systems, AV tech, you know, city county facilities to with with the goal of really essentially just looking at economies of scale because the more you can do, the lower the cost you can you can get for a lot of these projects. So doing them as one-offs can tend to be a significantly more expensive venture. So we're looking at, at potentially bringing in as many public partners as we can, doing on-site, you know, doing uh, facility assessments, looking at, uh, you know, structural assessments and things of that nature, making sure that, that any facility we are attempting to do this on makes, makes sense, both from a structural standpoint, but also from a financial standpoint. Uh, and uh, try and get the best price that we can for, for doing these types of projects, do an RFP, and then potentially look at bringing that back through management and then to the board to say, you know, here's what we think our options are for what we can do in the immediate future, and, and move forward from that. I know you've already asked a few questions, but if you have any, I'm willing to stick around. And uh, Jeremiah, so the, um, and so the plan is to do this uh, request for proposals Correct. for renewables on public properties um, and to issue that by the end of the summer. Is that, is that correct? Optimistically, yes. I would love to have this done by the end of the summer. Okay. Uh, well, I think that's... to a firm date, I'm in trouble. Sure, <laughs> sure. And issuing the RFP doesn't obligate the county to do anything. It's basically Absolutely. asking the marketplace to, all right, here's properties that we think could be feasible. Um, so tell us what's possible I and mean, what would it cost and what are the savings, you know, basically just bring us your best ideas, right? That is absolutely correct. Right. Yeah. Uh, none of the, the county nor any of the partners that would be involved in the RFP process would be obligated to move forward with any of those projects. It's just simply to get a really good firm idea of what's possible on the facilities that we have that we feel make the most sense for renewable energy. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I think that is, um, I think that is very exciting. I think, um, you know, we won't know what we're going to get until it comes in, right? But um, I think, and I think it's exciting that we're, um, you know, we're talking to these other public agencies in the community, the county schools, um, AB Tech, others. You know, um, we were just we were just talking about AB Tech's budget the other day in a small meeting. You know, they have about a $6 million budget. They spend a billion dollars of taxpayer money a year just on utilities. It's like 20% of their budget. It's kind of hard to understand but, but um, <laughs> so so um, I shut a building down in the summertime instead of letting it well I, I, in all summer. I, I, I agree we should attack it from all from all angles you know and, and we all have you know we all have work to do to do but on that so like it for. well the point the, the point I'm making is we spend tons of money on energy already right and I think that we're gonna see um, do this RFP process I think we're gonna get a lot of great proposals especially if we um, you know, do, by working with some of the other agencies, there'll be more facilities, and I think that will attract more interest from the sector. is my is my optimistic hunch. So um, I'm excited about it, and I think the community's going to be very excited about it. And we're not going to get to our goal in you know one step. No doubt there'll be more iterations of these kinds of things in the future. But I think we should um, I think we should launch in a strong way, and that's a great start. So. Um, other questions or thoughts? All right, yes. Jeremiah, thank you so much. Great, great update. Absolutely. All right. Um, you know, just one other, one other. Just as Jeremiah's a walk up, just one other thing I would just plug. And I know we've gotten updates from them before too, but um, and and it's a, it's a group we all like. But the, uh, you know, the Energy uh, Savers Network organization, which is one of the groups that does the weatherization. I don't know if you guys see stuff they post on Facebook ever, but it is, it is like, I just think it's so cool. I mean, they're just out there all the time and they've got all these volunteers going out and working in the program. So I just, I know y'all probably see that stuff too, but um, 
uh, and, and kudos to all those volunteers who are helping make it happen. But I'm glad it's it's one of the organizations that we're um, partnered with. All right, um, what is next, Josh Freeman? Good afternoon. Hi. All right, we have four rezoning proposals that are coming before you at your August 6th meeting. So what I'm doing today is just giving you a really brief overview of those so you can be prepared when they come so before I, August. I have a question before we sure. before we dive into this. Um, so these will be public hearings, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so I guess I just, you know, we had, we had sort of a discussion about this at the last meeting, but um, I just, uh, I mean, I appreciate us kind of having a chance to review some things before we vote on them, but I'm, just, I'm kind of wondering if we feel like it's appropriate to review these rezoning issues. You know, just internally, we're not making any decision today, but you certainly start forming opinions and having, you know, a lot of the dialogue here when we don't have, you know, we're not having the public hearing, we don't have the property owners here. So yeah, this I'll concern's been raised, and I just, I just kind of wanted to surface it to just yes. kind of have a yeah. little discussion about it. I would share your concern. Yeah. Yes, and then as a matter of fact, the folks behind us has raised that concern as yes, well. Yeah, I would share <laughs> so, and um, we have talked about it, and what they will show you today is just the maps. There's no other conversation. Cool. You change the agenda item, and this would not be on your next going forward. This will be the last, and I will talk about this. But I've also conferred with legal, and these are not the quasi judicials. If they were, they would not be here today. These are just straight zoning, so there's nothing illegal or wrong with doing them. So, but certainly open to y'all's conversations. Okay, but we're not we're not planning on kind of in the future doing. Okay. I'm, I think that's the right the right approach. Any okay. other comments? Okay, not doing it today. We well, we've already had Josh up here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'll do whatever. Uh, any other opinions on this, commissioners? Okay. We've got one one I mean, one, I, one I, no. I, I'm, uh, I mean, there are some people who aren't here today. I just, I mean, I, 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 mean, I kind of support what you what you're saying. I'd be more comfortable if you know, we're talking about their properties and they were here. You know, they, this is just a, just a, a preview, that. sort of informational. I, the I feel comfortable with that okay. today, okay. personally. I, let's just have just yeah, high, level, high level information. But the right. then, uh, so, if, yeah, you yeah, did, yeah. if you didn't get the hint, we just saved a bunch of time. So, you kind of highlight this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Josh. I'm happy to get back to the office. <laughs> okay, uh, so the first application, uh, uh, the applicants are Mr. and Mrs. Uharka. They came before you some time ago, um, went to the planning board yesterday, we're back in August. Uh, the application is to rezone. The original request was a 14 acre rezoning from, R, from RLD, which is a residential low density district to R1 um, based on dialogue with both boards and staff. The applicants reduced their application to a 1.7 acre request. Uh, and just for anyone who's not aware, this is in Swannanova, just west of Owen High School. Um, so that is the first application. And I'm going to move through these quickly. If you need me to come back, I will. Uh, the second application is uh, Radishan or Freedom of Christ, uh, similar to the previous. Uh, it was. It was before the planning board twice, uh, the planning board considered it, the applicant withdrew, came back with a revised request. So it started off as a roughly 60 acre request for res from residential low density to R3 residential. They've since revised that down to roughly 20 acres in size. Uh, this project is in Old Hominy. It's west of Asheville and north of I-40. Uh, and again, it's RLD to R3. Uh, McDonald, Lois McDonald and her family have requested rezoning. Uh, it's a roughly six acre tract. Uh, it's in off Long Shoals Road in Hart, just west of Avery Creek Beth Hospital and Oak Grove Western Oak Grove Christian Church. Uh, the request is to rezone the property from R2 residential to neighborhood services. Commercial neighborhood services is our sort of lowest intensity commercial zoning district. Um, and the planning board again considered this yesterday. And you'll see it in August. And last but not least, uh, Rebecca Regal uh, has requested rezoning a property from uh, R2 residential to the EMP. EMP is your highest intensity kind of commercial slash industrial zoning district. This is a 1.2 acre tract, uh, Avery's Creek off Brevard Road, just north of the Long Schultz Brevard Road section. We can dirty any questions. 
August 6th meeting, uh, we're requesting a public hearing for the Mountain Community Capital Fund. Uh, this public hearing is not a request for any new funding. It's also not a request for a board vote. Um, if you'll remember recently, related to economic development agreements, we realized the general statutes require that we have a public hearing for any spending in the current budget year. So this is one item where we come to you, we'll host the public hearing, just to allow the public to comment on the program, uh, but we'll not be asking for your vote um, because you've already voted on this on numerous occasions. Uh, as way of reminder, August 17th, 2017, you approved $200,000 for funding this, that budget cycle. In October 6th of 2018, you approved the contract that uh, governs the Mountain Community Capital Fund. Uh, since then, we've been working to refine some of our processes, to establish the board, uh, to make sure that we had community representation. So just wanted to give you a heads up, August 6th, uh, we'll be noticing a public hearing, um, no vote required of the board, no additional funding requested of you, uh, just a public hearing to allow the public to comment and ultimately release the funds that have already been budgeted in this <coughs> vote. Any questions? Thank you. Thanks, Tim. All right. All right, that's the, our published uh, list of items. So uh, any <clears throat> other items commissioners wish to chat about before we adjourn? All right, uh, well, we will, um, I'm sorry, what, commissioner? Bring mine up tonight. Bring what up? Anything I want to talk about. Is it on the agenda? Uh, not that I can still talk. Well, let's talk about that. I mean, um, you, we are gonna, I mean, if we vote to follow the agenda, then we will follow the agenda. So um, if it's something that's not on the agenda, I think what we've done in the past, we've said, we've said that, you know, commissioner could, when we get to public comment, could take, you know, three minutes to, you know, comment like any other citizen. So I think that's how we've, I think that's how we've handled that in the past. But I do want us to follow the agenda once we vote to approve that. Um, but there would be an opportunity at the end to, uh, you know, if you want to comment on something. Well, there's stuff in the agenda that I want to comment on. There's stuff that's well, of course. not on the agenda that should have been commented on a long, long time ago. Well, if you want to propose to put something on the agenda, there's a uh, process to do that. So just feel free to, to, to let folks know that you'd like to do that. Well, the main thing, Brownie, is you called. Let's just do it here. Okay. Okay. You call Chuck Edwards trying to get him to kill the deal for AB Tech. Because he called me. Do you mean to explain what we I voted on? The thing. Yeah. There's three votes on the item upstairs for AB Tech. And you and Dennis King called him trying to get this deal killed. Do you mean to explain what I did? The what? How, I would be happy to explain to you what I did do. You called him and asked him that you supported Dennis King for getting rid of this deal. And what it's for is because that way the new four that you have over there that you can control, okay, that they can vote on stuff and take this money that's been set aside, able to utilize it in other areas, like solar panels. <laughs> well, and what I, what I, what I did do yeah, is I, I was, I I, you're, well, you're, you're, I'm not going to disagree with you, Mike. Uh, the chair of AB Tech trustees and the president of the school notified me that they had significant concerns about the language of the bill and they asked that they, they expressed to me that they would prefer for it not to be adopted this year they'd like to have a chance to look at the language some more I think they would like to have a bill but they were they were concerned about some of the language as it's drafted well, it and they matter. and they asked me what my position was I said well you I'm just one person but if if AB Tech does not want this bill passed in its present form I support what they want, and that's and that's true. So, well, I'm just I'm just all, all I've said all I've said is when to our legislators is I support whatever AB Tech wants is what I want, and that's all I've said. And I've got a folder that high of where you told this gentleman what he needed to be doing in his job. How about that? Nobody else, you know. If I get something from somebody upstairs, it's sending an email to all seven of the commissioners. 
-hmm. Been done that way. But I got a folder that that, <coughs> that you and him have talked about going through your friend over the city of Asheville and everything. You are in a conflict of interest in everything that you try to do because you go out oh, throughout the country, throughout the country, and tell people how they can make this solar deal work. That's your job. You go talk to them, they pay you. I got a friend that's got a solar farm, paid 120 some odd thousand dollars for it. He's got, he's got a lot of solar stuff. But now it's costing him every month because he has to pay for it. Well, it ain't costing him today because the sun shines. But when it was bad, he ended up paying a good power for the transformers that's in the ground. The money's not there anymore, so there's nothing there anymore. Mike, this issue comes up okay, over well, and over. There's no conflict of interest here. Well, There's no conflict of interest here any more than and each of us has okay. jobs, pursuits well, outside of our work let's here. Let's one more out there since you don't want to do it upstairs. Here we go upstairs and we give three cars to a nonprofit that I ain't got a clue who did. Okay? Three of them. <clears throat> Who's on the board, friend? With that nonprofit. My wife does serve on the board. Exactly, because I couldn't figure out why in the world would you carry something in to us about cars, county giving a nonprofit cars to sell. Mike, that's not a conflict of interest either. Yeah, yeah, well, well, she's, it's, a, she's a volunteer, she's not compensated. Yeah. And yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm well educated in our conflict of interest well, obligations, well as, as all of us need to be, as all of us need to be. And neither of the things you've cited well, to are actual well, conflicts of interest. And I don't think our, I don't think if that the work if of this board a, if is, there is a conflict of interest, frankly, Mike, I think it's yours because you actively bid on these cars the county's selling. So if there's anyone actually, actually if there's anyone that has a financial conflict of interest, it is you. I frankly. bought one car, okay? At least I bought one. I didn't give the damn thing away. <clears throat> well, like this, it was mine. This board, oh, I did give two away to the fire department. Well, I this board, care of this board voted on it, and I know you don't agree with it, but it was a vote of this body, okay? So vote of the body what? Of the county commission voted on oh, this. Well, I mean, you, know, you figure out how to get rid of me on that AB Tech bill that I worked so hard on. That was you. I know that. Okay. I have no problems. But you do not need to be down here telling these people about the running the energy bill. Somebody else needs to take that board over, like the guy sitting next to you, or either one of the guys sitting next to you. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to give it up because you that's your thing. Okay. Well, I appreciate your perspective on that. I don't agree with it, but I got the right to express it so thank you all right anything else all right we're jumping out